When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers! Pizza! Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is, we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to Metro PCS. Stop by Metro PCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Requires new line. During congestion, a fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced fees. Video streams at up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions. Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Unlimited Realities. I am your host, Lisa Zimmer, and today I'm really happy to bring on best-selling author, Oriah Mountain Dreamer, to talk to us a little bit today about summer solstice, which is coming up on the 21st of June, and really what the summer solstice represents and how we can incorporate it into our lives for you know, more of a grounding and, and more of a focus in regard to our priorities. So, Oriah, thank you so very much for being on Unlimited Realities today. Welcome. My pleasure. Happy to be here, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, last time we spoke, you were on back in December, and we spoke about the winter solstice. And I had <laughs> people just loved knowing and hearing that show. And so I'm really happy to bring the listeners today your wisdom in regard to the summer solstice and everything else you can enlighten us on today. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. And let's talk about what summer solstice is because we're moving into kind of um, a sl- – well, for me personally, I'm moving into a slower, slower pace and, and taking advantage of summer and time off with the kids and, and mm-hmm. kind of arranging my schedule. But what is the summer solstice in regard to – us well it is the time of the the longest day and the shortest night so it's the time of the longest light that's with us and it it always strikes me as um and just interesting in in north america and particularly uh well in the northern hemisphere and especially in regions unlike florida where we get a lot of snow and whatnot of course we tend to <clears throat> take some time in the summer to try to slow down. And in some ways, uh, which is wonderful, always wonderful to do that, but it's also happening at a time when a natural cycle, in a sense, is is blooming, is really, um, you know, I, I, for the last 10 years, have lived most of the time in a farming community where, of course, um, this becomes their busiest time of year um, because there are, you know, everything is growing and uh, there will be repeated harvests and uh, seeding and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's interesting to me that culturally, we do this kind of uh, taking of time off, in a sense, of our our usual work, which makes great sense, especially um, here in Canada where <laughs> summer is short. Um, right. But at the same time, there's all this kind of energy available of, of long days, of uh, lots of light, of lots of warmth, um, all kinds of good things like that. So it is... Um, it's also a kind of out, it can be uh, a kind of outward turned energy um where we kind of go into the world and see what we want to do with that energy and you know speaking of energy we just got through the eclipse yesterday and we had that was the second in re, in regard to the June 1st eclipse and the energy <laughs> is buzzing i mean i can feel the energy you know, days before the eclipse and, and people are either really focused or really freaking out. And um, <laughs> and so it was. It really felt like I could feel the balloon expand yesterday and then pop, and it was really a blessing for the pop. <laughs> and, and starting to feel that release. And the energy, I do feel that shift. I do feel us coming into the summer solstice with um, kind of a new charge, kind of a... Mm-hmm. A you know for me it's it's kind of a reflective perspective it's kind of like okay what's important and where do I want to put my energy and what can I let slack right now that's really not going to come back and slam me in the face mm-hmm. so you know I'm looking at and the kids being home of course that's my priority so I want yes. to play so you know <laughs> so yeah. I'm I'm definitely focusing on that in fact we're taking a road trip as soon as the show's over today so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what where can we how can we incorporate this light into our lives? Um I know some like like there's as Aztec and shamanic rituals that people sometimes 
you know, gather up little um, kind of like little medicine bags and, and offer them to, you know, in sacred um, circle in regard mm-hmm. to summer solstice. Um, are there different ways that we can honor summer solstice in where we feel, you know, more of the power and the energy um, that the earth and, and nature and God is providing us right now? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And mostly that's about um, how you, I mean, and, and the how here has to do with what kind of tradition you come from and um, and how you want to um, symbolically uh, participate in a sense. And I, and I say symbolically not meaning, you know, versus any real. I mean um, really focusing um, and honing intent and participation in the energy with the use of symbols. That's that's what we do. Where human beings are symbol makers, you know, um, we create symbols that hold for us a certain kind of energy that helps bring to consciousness uh, what we want to do deliberately. You know, and one of the lovely things about the solstices is this uh, a constant sense of movement. So you know, in the winter solstice, we go through this longest night in this inward turning, but as it's happening, it's immediately then moving into a beginning of the return of the light. So there's a promise there. And of course the okay. reverse happens here. We're coming up to this time of the greatest light, the longest day, and and instantly as we move through that, we begin to move back toward the darkness again. The days start to get shorter after um, June 21st. Um, and so for me, that's all just about... Uh, you know, that sort of phrase of this too will pass applies right. equally to everything. It applies to the ecstatic moment. It applies to the moment of despair, that there is this constant motion. There is no stopping that. That's nature, and we are as much a part of nature as everything else. There's no holding on, because I, I suspect that many of us would, you know, take great consolation in that movement when it's the winter solstice, um, but mm-hmm. there might be a little bit of a wanting to hold on to the light of the summer solstice. Um, <laughs> but, you know, light and dark have both have their, their gifts, and you don't get one without the other kind of thing. And, you right. know, darkness is the place of fertility. It's the place where the seed really dies. You know, the outer shell rots, dies, it splits open, and then you get the shoot. And then it climbs towards this light that we're now um, moving in, and uh, it blooms. So the summer solstice is often associated in terms of ceremonial terms with um, lots of greenery, lots of flowers, lots of what blooms. And again, it brings to mind, um, you know, in certain Buddhist circles, there will often be on the altar always fresh cut flowers as a reminder both of beauty but also um, fragility and how quickly um, things die. They change constantly. There's no uh-huh. hanging on. So I mention that because I think sometimes that's the challenge of the summer solstice is not to try and grab something and hang on. <laughs> because right, right. It's the only constant here, right? But the right. thing that fascinates me most is, is if you assume that there's an availability of energy. Um, okay. Then and we and there's always you know a constant assumption in in our culture especially that we don't have enough energy which we could mean we don't have enough time we don't have enough physical energy we don't have enough money we don't have enough space all of these just forms of energy right okay um, and I have you know I've had uh, chronic fatigue syndrome so I I highly appreciative of the need for energy but one of the things I I look at all the time is in my own life even. Is when I get a little bit of energy, more than say my usual, what do I do with it? I'm somewhat mortified to discover that some of the times I appear to just sort of throw it away uh, to whatever <laughs> happens to cross my path next. You know, I have a day that has a bit more energy, and something crosses my path. And uh, which may be a request from somebody, or and it, and it may be, you know, will you participate in this or whatever, and it may be good stuff, but I. With that little bit of energy, I seem to be overly eager to just give it to whatever crosses my path without necessarily discerning whether or not this is the way I I want to use this. Now, one of the gifts of chronic fatigue is you become really aware of where your energy level is at. And okay. I, once had a, I once had somebody I was with accuse me of being an energy miser because I was kind of measuring out what I could do. But that becomes a reality <laughs> if you have a chronic illness. 
Um, okay. But even with that, I'm surprised how unconscious I can go. So, you know, I, I do this in lots of different ways, but I think this is a, a particular time of year to do this, is is to look at how you're spending the energy you do have in each day. And and that's not just external activity, of course, it's the internal activity also. If you have a task in front of you that's not um, the most pleasant task uh, for you in, in your preferences, um, that can take much more energy if you rail about it the whole internally the whole time you're doing it, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of are there just certain things you could just uh, set down and walk away from. Right. The real question for me is why? I mean, this is in my own life. Is when I get some energy, extra energy. You know, I'm feeling particularly good. Why mm-hmm. would I throw that away? Why would I fritter that away? And then we bump up against um, what we're afraid we might do if we had more. What uh-huh. is our? What's the responsibility? If we had more energy, more time, more money, more whatever form of the energy you feel like you you know you want more of, and they do this thing where they look at people across the board in every income bracket, and everybody thinks about 25 percent more than what they have is what they need, which I find very funny. Um, so it doesn't matter where they are on that scale, kind of thing. That's on our, pretty much everybody thinks you know if I just had about 25 percent more, everything would be fine. Um, wow. And clearly that doesn't yeah so. So the question is, if you open yourself to this energy of the lengthening light, to consciously bringing it in to your body, your health, your heart, your mind, your spirit, um, what do you want to do with it? What do you want to dedicate it to? What do you want to consecrate it to? Because consecration is a way of dedicating something to that which is sacred to you. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, the answer to that question is always the same, um, which is to write more which is uh, to, you know, I have these three books that are sort of semi-finished and life interferes in various ways. Um, What surprises me is when I get a little bit of extra energy, whether that's time or, you know, whatever, I don't necessarily instantly go there. Okay. Um, I seem to go, you know, I seem to go unconscious about that, especially if somebody else, you know, crosses my path and says, oh, will you do this? And I go, sure. Right. (laughs) Right. Right, uh, you know, and I think that happens to, and 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 again, it's it's about doing good things. It's not that somebody's asking me to do something that I don't have any has any value for me or whatnot, but to keep that discrimination, because part of the lesson of the solstice is you have this build of energy, and the cycle keeps going. So, so from that moment on, the the light we we begin to get less light as we move around the wheel, right? Uh huh. So right. You you can't hang on to it. So how are you going to use what you have? Okay. How, and that usually starts with a bit of an audit. You know, how am I using the energy I have right now? Right. And uh, am I am I being wasteful in regard to what I really want to do, or am I saying mm-hmm. yes when I really want to say no? Yes. Yes. And Boy, or, that and am, I, and am I wasting energy being guilty when I say no? Or resentful when I say yeah. yes, you know. I mean, because even when the yes and no is said, then there's the way that you proceed from there can use a lot of energy or a little energy, and right, and and you know, it's also of course um, about stepping into some kind of flow, um, mm-hmm. where you where you feel that that you know it's not just that I have to kind of store up energy in my body and then expend it, collapse and store it up again, which, you know, is a lot of the time how chronic illness can feel. <laughs> so right, it's more right. about how do I stay tapped in. And those are about the little things every day. What do I know about myself is the way that I need to get up in the morning if I want really to stay connected to that which gives me energy or how I go to bed at night or everything in between, you know. Um, it's, right. it's more about the how um, than anything else. What I spend it on, you know, is depends on a lot of things. Depends on the needs, does depend to some degree on the needs of the people around me. Um, whether I have small children or I happen to have two aging parents who have some needs. You know, there, there, are, there are times when we really are called to expend um, energy. Small children, of course, is the most constant um, right. where energy needs to be expended consistently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and their care, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. And even-